Okay, well, given the natural silence has fallen on the room, um, it seems like a good time to begin. Um, I'm Mark Crowell, and I'm Director of Research at the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, one of the sponsors of, of this uh, event, and also um, very much taking an interest in one we've been name checked quite a bit this morning, which is always good to, to get. Um, but also thinking very much about the ways in which our community of researchers and the communities we engage with through our research projects have a lot to contribute to some of these ongoing debates that are taking place within the heritage sector, not just through the work of Andrew Thompson and the Care for the Future theme but also heritage as one of the HRC's um, three priority research areas and the way it cuts across various research themes that we support at the current time. Um, this session, which is the final proper session of the conference, um, is entitled The Future of Heritage Protection. And I think we've agreed, we've just had a kind of pre-meeting over lunch amongst uh, the panel, that we're very much going to focus on this question of the future. Um, there's been a very interesting conversation that's been taking place in the sessions uh, over the last day and a half, uh, and also at the margins of those sessions of coffee breaks and, and elsewhere, um, around the kinds of perspectives that everyone in the room is bringing to this debate, uh, and also the experiences with the reflections that we're making on this century um, since the Act of 1913. What we'd really like to do in this session is think a bit towards the future. So we're going to do a different uh, kind of setup in some respects. Each of our presenters is going to have five to seven minutes uh, or so to pitch, I suppose is the best way of describing it, their perspective on this question um, based on their own experience uh, and also the projects that they're involved with. Um, we're very much taking that as a springboard to be, in some cases, uh, provocative with the comments they'll say, uh, but in most cases, in fact in all cases, wanting to generate perhaps a different kind of debate and discussion for the remainder of the session. So these will be refle reflections and perspectives from their own experience and also a sense of what they see emerging from the context of the discussions that have been taking place at this event already. Um, I've got the challenge uh, not only of deciphering your handwriting on the postcards, but also feeding in some of those comments into the debate um, that we'll have after the presenters have all done their presentations. Um, but there are discernible trends emerging from that, which I think will prove uh, fruitful, that will tie together, but also show up some of the differences in the perspectives of the panel members this afternoon, and also some of the debates that have been taking place during the course of today um, already. Um, so we're going to go straight into the presentations. Um, I'll introduce each speaker um, just before they present uh, to give you a context from their, their background and where they're coming from. Um, and then once we've had all the presentations, we'll go into a more open uh, discussion amongst the panellists, but also with the rest of the uh, event as well. So our first presenter is uh, Dr Chris Meany. Um, he is an architectural historian and a chartered planner, and he's asked me to emphasise that dual perspective uh, as providing the context of what he's going to say. He was trained as an academic historian in the US, moved to the UK, and worked at English Heritage for eight years. But for the past 15 years, he has been in private practice as a senior partner in the planning and development team at Montague Evans, chartered surveyors and property advisors, working from the firm's central London office. There he runs a team of professionals who work on development projects, and you'll see in the programme the range of activities that he and his team have been involved with. Um, he also continues to work on his academic research uh, as a historian and has published extensively on the history of the conservation movement, including William Morris, so you may well be able to answer Lloyd's question this morning, what would William Morris do? Um, but that may well not be part of what he says uh, in his presentation for us uh, now. So Chris, can I do it to you? Good afternoon, and thank you very much. And I'm the, the post lunch first one of them, so I'll try to keep it punchy. Is this something? Is this something? Um, so I'd like to look at a few things briefly in these opening remarks. Um, particularly, I'd like to focus the trend to list more and more post war and indeed recent buildings. What I'd like to do is briefly follow through the unintended consequences and conundrums this gives rise to, and venture to say, by way of conclusion, what other considerations we might take into account if we're considering whether or not to preserve a post-war building. And my perspective is, as Mark has said, someone whose art goes perhaps quite unusually from academic practice through the civil service effectively into a very commercial practice. And so seeing the whole development process from purchase to disposal, if you will, uh, because heritage assets are usually property. 
Um, so first about listing and uh, what's happened since uh, in the last 10 or 15 years and the designation of recent and post-war architecture. Now, the strict interpretation of the listing criteria, I think, should leave us in no doubt that for a recent building to qualify at any grade, even locally grade two, it has to be not just special, but really very special <coughs> indeed. And that's simply because they're not old. They don't have that claim to our attention. And yet, over the last five years, you would be surprised at the number of pre-purchase diligence exercises I've done looking at 1960s buildings. Are they listable? Um, anything nowadays with a bit of curb appeal, um, if I can put it that way, will trigger an interest or a worry from a developer and say, we need to get this looked into, and that's interesting. And at the same time, I know the listing branch is bombarded, if that's a fair word, with requests to list such buildings. Some of them are bona fides requests, and others are just vexatious requests. Um, it's inevitable statistically, when all this stuff is happening, that uh, more things will get listed uh, from this period than they are. What are the effects of this? Well, a series of propositions. I won't say these are certain, but they're things that might happen in the future. I think potentially, first, one of the effects is to suppress the quality of new buildings. Once it becomes clear to an owner investing or a developer investing four, five hundred, six hundred million pounds in a stunning new building, that at the end of their lease period in 20 or 25 years, they won't be able to redevelop the building because it will be listed, is a serious disincentive to thinking about architectural quality. The case is made very dramatically by the City of London. Over the last 25 years, Peter Rees has tried to make it into an excellent gallery of contemporary architecture. Gallery. In 25 years, it could become a museum of contemporary architecture. So, that begs the question, should buildings winning awards for architectural excellence now simply be listed? Let's just be done with the matter so everybody's clear. Um, this is a really serious point of view for uh, issue for owners, because post-World War, post -World War II buildings and recent buildings are fundamentally unlike traditional buildings in the way they perform. After the war, they were built to minimum specifications, a bit like racehorses, to do one thing and to do it very efficiently. As a result, they don't have inherent redundancy and robustness to respond to new uses, and they're often built with untried materials that need to be replaced, and this challenges the very notions of what we can conserve. Now, I'm very familiar with the repast to these observations. I hear it a lot. Well, listing is one thing. First, we identify value, and then it falls to the planning system to manage it. And uh, perhaps being controversial, I, I'd say that's not a credible response. Um, and I dare say anyone who says that has not had the pleasure, perhaps, of trying to negotiate a very contentious list of building consent for a building that has no future use. Uh, could sound to be corrected. What are the shortcomings of the designation system that are thrown up by this point? Um, and I think as an art historian, I can probably confidently say that our designation system is based on romantic ideals of the picturesque, on what's purely visually <laughs> interesting or historically of note, it's not moved, in fact, one jot since the late 18th century, and we're stuck in a world of sentiment. And yet, let's remember, architecture is, in most every case, an applied art. It is a social facility. To those who develop, own, use, advise property, a defining trait of the building is its use or commodity value, and that's what we think about. And so, in addition to something being attractive, we should ask how well it serves its purpose. Is it fit for it? Now, these are not hard-boiled commercial concepts. You only need to think about Vitruvius, Alberti, Ruskin, Corbusier, all of them, and most architectural critics have always linked firmness, commodity, with delight, the important triad. It's impossible to separate architectural quality from performance. Now, skeptics might ask here, well, what, on what possible objective basis, then, would you assess buildings? Well, the answer is, well, very simple. There are a number of objective bases that reflect buildings in use and their quality. You might ask, has a building been utilized fully for its whole working life? Does it have value in the marketplace? Does it contribute to economic and social activity and vitality? Does it demonstrate the enduring qualities of good urban design? Is it reasonably easy to maintain when measured against other items on the market, such as they are? Is it adaptable without any really major interventions or demolitions? And critically, last but not least, are the people who use it happy in using it and want to be there? All of these should, in classical architectural theory and indeed modern architectural theory, differentiate good buildings from bad buildings. And none of these are really particularly considered when it comes to designate buildings. Um, now, I think there's a very simple explanation for this, and it's not offered by way of criticism. Um, any civil administrative system only and can only reflect the values and understanding of the people who have set it up and who run it. 
And I think probably there is a very big divide between the professionals that generally regulate the historical environment and those people who own buildings and have to develop them. Um, and I wonder, is not the constituency of this conference proof of that? There are, as far as I'm aware, no developers here today. Um, there's no building owners except possibly the side of antiquaries, which owns this building, but they're a special <coughs> purchaser as defined in the Royal Institute for Chartered Surveyors Red Book. Um, there are no, uh, are there any investment advisors here? Are there any people from banks dealing with investment? How many other development surveyors are there here today? There are a couple of town planners. Uh, this is overwhelmingly a conference which is about people in one sector with one background talking to itself. And I, I don't mean to be critical of that, it simply seems to be a matter of fact. Um, and think even the way the designations are done, they're done by the Department for Culture. They could be done in consultation with the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. They could be done as they once were through the planning industry. Um, now it's very easy to criticize and it's unfair just to leave you with criticism. So I'm going to make two what I hope are pithy suggestions for how we might solve the system, this problem. I think we should take a more rounded view of what a building is. It's not a piece of our history, it's a social commodity. It's something that embodies precious resources and it occupies land which must be used wisely in the interest of sustainable development. And then second, we somehow must try to bridge what is an increasingly wider gap in my experience uh, of the two different perspectives of the academic and regulatory sector and the owning sector. I think if we're to make any real difference in the way these matters are taken forward. Thank you, Chris. Um, our second speaker is Robert Bewley, who's Director of Operations at the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, Robert joined HLF in May 2007 in his current role as Director of Operations. Prior to this, he worked as a Regional Director for English Heritage in the South West, and before that as Head of Survey for English Heritage. He trained as an archaeologist at Manchester and Cambridge Universities, and also worked for the Royal Commission on the Historic Monuments of England, specialising in aerial archaeology. Can you all hear me from here, rather than stand up? Um, the only similarity between me and John Powell on the panel is that um, Peter Torrey and P and are both archaeologists. Um, this session, we've been briefed, is about forward-looking, and that's what I'm going to do in the next five minutes. But first, just wanted to summarise a little bit about what the lottery is, does, and where it came from. Um, the discussion this morning touched on the whole business of the UK, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We are a UK funder in the Heritage Lottery Fund. We're very proud that we are a UK funder and we hope that people continue. Um, whenever we discuss what might change, we say, well, what's best for the heritage? And we think that actually being a UK wide funder is best for the heritage. Uh, whatever happens in, in the various countries happens in the various countries. Now, why did the Heritage Lottery Fund ever come into existence? In one sense, it was because of a politician who took a very, very practical approach politician who loved the arts and loved sports in particular um, and his view was the arts, culture, sport and heritage will never compete with the big boys of health and defence, welfare and education, so don't even try to compete, you will never do it John Major was the Prime Minister who created the lottery and said that for, for every pound spent 28 people go to good causes those good causes were the arts community, sports and heritage so every time you buy a lottery ticket, and how many of you buy a lottery ticket? <laughs> right? Uh, it goes up to two pounds. It goes up to two pounds in October. Um, I won it last week, and I didn't know whether to tell my children or not, but it was only ten pounds, so I did tell them if it was any more. People buy it because of the prices. That's why people buy lottery tickets. Five p of every pound you pay to spend goes to the heritage, and since 1994, five billion pounds has gone into the heritage. That is an awful lot of money. So well done to John Major, is what I say. Um, the other thing that was raised this morning was the role of government. And you talked a lot about the role of government and non-government bodies. For me, it's very simple. Statutory bodies should do their statutory duties and should be funded properly to do. Because if you don't, and then you say, oh, well, the lottery will fund to do the statutory duty, what about it? And we, are, we always have a very, very firm no get lost minister. Um, I don't care how much I say. Um, because, and, and the word that they will use is it's to do with additionality, the moment you start to, as it were, support government, 
there lies complete disaster because the lottery is completely independent of the government. If we got a phone call from the Prime Minister to say, would you fund that project, we would say it will depend on the quality of the project, sir. Mm -hmm. um, we would not be influenced, and that's absolutely as it should be. Now, what changes is what the government will or will not fund. So the first act of the new coalition when they came in was to say we can't afford the five million quid for Stonehenge, we're not going to fund it. Which is laying down to Walter, to English Heritage National Trust and the Heritage Lottery Fund because it's a joint project, and they said, where are we going to find the five million from? So our trustees said, we'll give them the five million. Now that's not supporting the government. The government said, we're not going to fund it. We didn't have to fund it, it's a visitor centre. So they didn't need to fund it. It's not their statutory duty to, to fund a business centre from which they will make money. Um, whether it was the right decision or not, completely different. <coughs> now, what I wanted to say was, what's the starting point in terms of successful heritage? And I would say the starting point is to do with communities and people. Imagine the situation where, let's go back to Stonehenge for a moment, that the local population had been brought on board first, all those years ago, however many years ago, and actually thought it was a good idea to have a long board tunnel. We would probably have them digging it now. As it happens, we don't. But if you don't start with communities of people, I think then you are, you are walking into a disaster. Next question then is, what, what's it going to be like in 30 to 40 years' time in terms of heritage protection? And that's one of the questions, in a sense, we've been, we've been looking at. If you take the State of Nature report, built on the Lawton report, about how to protect the natural environment, the summary, and it is a really, really uh, tight summary, is more, bigger, and joined up. And I would say, let's have the same for the heritage. It's not, I'm not necessarily saying we need more scheduled monuments. Actually, we don't want any scheduled monuments because we want landscapes and areas understood in a much better way, so that if it's joined up, it makes a much better way of protecting both the natural and the historic environment, because the two are, to me, completely inseparable. Now, finally, the other thing that's really hit me uh, is listening to the debate last night and looking through all the papers and everything else, is that actually, as a sector, and I think Chris is absolutely right, we do spend too long talking to ourselves, is we lack, we lack vision. And I think we should focus on what the historic and natural environment should look like. We get the heritage we deserve. We are far too passive and far too reactive. Now, we have tried in the Heritage Lottery Fund to look at this through the strategic framework for, um, well worth looking at, but it's a practical and pragmatic document. It's well worth looking at if you want a grant from us. But when you stand back from it, as I try and do, what is it actually saying? And although I'm not a great tweeter, I'm a lurking tweeter, um, I just don't have the time, even for 140 words. I thought, well, let's see if I could tweet uh, a vision that was less than 140 words. And this is it. And it's 67 characters. A future for the heritage, colon, because that's a character. A future for the heritage. Use it, don't abuse it, or you'll lose it. Thank you. So far we've heard suggestions for the um, registration regime, we've heard a tweet, um, we're now going to move on to a different kind of context for some of this discussion uh, with Michael Loveday, who's Chief Executive of Officer of Heart, which is um, an urban regeneration project based in Norwich. He's been involved professionally in urban regeneration for more than 30 years, um, and the Heart project was established in 2004. He's also got extensive uh, European collaboration uh, experience, uh, particularly around the Shaping 24 project, which for those we don't know coordinates the principal 12 heritage sites in Norwich and in Ghent. So, Michael, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, there must be the other urban planner in the room, I think, after the, the first speaker. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, a, a credible future for heritage protection and how it might work in the, over the next hundred years possibly and I thought maybe a good basis is to look at where my organisation had come from and 
what might make it sustainable because that's what concentrates my mind on a regular basis. Um, we're Norwich based and our job is to coordinate and champion heritage within the east of England but we operate um, globally and have done work with the World Bank in Washington and uh, the World League of Historic Cities in Nara to name but a couple. Um, I think uh, a very significant key to the future is, uh, as Bob just said, engaging um, communities. And the first step in doing that is to make them aware of what is there. As several people have said, we all live in the same club, so we know about it. But people out there don't know about it, but they'd like to know about it. Um, we took over at Heritage Open Days about nine years ago, uh, locally. Before we took it over, there were 12 events attracting 5,000 visits over four days. Over the last weekend, we delivered the biggest Heritage Open Day event in the UK or Ireland outside London. Over 200 events and 150,000 visits, uh, not 5,000 visits. And we said to customers, what did you think of that? And they said, it wasn't bad, <coughs> but you didn't do enough. So we think the trick is to make people aware of what there is, and that doesn't mean um, putting stuff onto a historic environment database in the kind of language that, that we speak, but somehow getting it out there so people can find out what it is and then use it. And the other part of that is to make it coherent. You can't just throw a riot of stuff at people. You can't say there's a lot of old stuff in the east of England come and see it because that doesn't work really. You have to make it coherent and one of the projects, uh, as the chair said, uh, that we've done recently is a project to pull together the principal 12 historic buildings in, in Norwich, uh, which we believe are probably um, one of the best sets of historic buildings in the whole of the UK, and to get the set working as a coordinated destination. But then we develop that further um, with a decent amount of European money by working with the 12 best historic buildings in Ghent, in Flanders, and creating a unified, joined up, coordinated set. Now, the good thing about that was that people could read and use the set um, through a whole range of um, media, as described up there, and were able to use them a lot more effectively. But the other good thing was not just the joining up of the sites, but the joining up of the institutions. Um, we were able to work with Flemish heritage experts, people in cathedrals in, <coughs> in Norwich were able to work with cathedrals in Ghent, castles in Ghent, old people's homes across the, the two cities. And I think there, for the future of heritage, is another lesson. We can't live in our little boxes and do our things on our own. We have to collaborate with other people in the field and beyond the field to deliver inspirational and sustainable things for the sector. <coughs> the third point, and you may have noticed on the first two slides, there's a bottom red line to all the things I've talked about. The Heritage Open Days deliver something like three quarters of a million pounds of value over four days. Um, the uh, Norwich 12 project I talked about delivered eight million pounds of value over three years. And this is another project, it's a sort of um, coordinated retail destination project that we delivered the Heritage End for. And as you see, the New Economics Foundation found that it's likely to deliver £17 million pounds of benefit. So you have to not just do it because it's a nice thing, but you have to measure what it does and then shout about what it does as well. Um, this is not shouting at the government. Um, Lloyd came along and talked to a, a big international conference we ran in in the East last November, and he spent an hour telling people there was no point in beating your head against the doors of the Treasury to say our sector delivers value because they don't want to know. Um, if they ask you a question about demonstrating value and you demonstrate it, they'll ask you a different question. Um, so you need to do it to demonstrate to all kinds of other players uh, in, in the economy and in the social infrastructure, but not the Treasury. <coughs> You need to engage 
audiences and the right audiences in the future. Um, people like her will be the future of the sector. And if you look around the kind of venues that we support at the moment, you won't see people like her. You'll see people like me, old, white, middle class. Um, and, and what we need in the future is to broaden and differentiate that audience to a wide range of things. So we do what some of the speakers talked about this morning. We do a thing called subversive heritage. We're going to do a project about the guild system. How interesting does that sound to young kids in schools? So we subversified it by making it about dragons. And we managed to attract 75,000 visits over just two weeks and had an economic impact of £400,000. You need to build new alliances. Um, I talked about one European project we're working on, um, working on another one with the French, with um, Polymage Haute Normandie, to um, deliver joined up views of how to use um, archive film and how to preserve it and how to get it out there. And you might think, well, that's got nothing at all to do with what we're interested in, because presumably and predominantly we're interested in buildings. But what we've done is to do film shows in buildings, to do film shows with performed music in buildings, to use French expertise um, to steal their ideas and use them in England. And I think learning not just from people immediately in our own sector, but people across the North Sea and beyond is also a very useful thing to do. Um, I talked earlier about engaging the public or at least infecting the public. I think you then need to turn them into advocates and we've done quite a lot of work with that. So ultimately, politicians won't think what we do is relevant unless the people who put the cross on the ballot paper think it's relevant. And if we manage to get to a position where the voting public think cultural heritage is very important, then politicians will think it's very important. And I talked about our European friends, certainly in Flanders, and in France, and a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to the uh, former Norwegian president of ICOMOS. The governments there get it because the people get it. And I think when we get the general public well behind heritage and we don't talk about, well, there are 500 members in this heritage organisation, so that's quite important. When we've got the whole public thinking heritage is very important, then politicians will think it's important to put it on the agenda. And you need to spin the product as well. One of our very weird things is that when Unilever, we're going to dump um, Coleman's Mustard Shop, the only mustard shop and museum in the United Kingdom four years ago. Uh, they were sensibly going to dump it because it was hemorrhaging £100,000 a year. Um, we took it over, ran it, turned it round, but now we use it as a device again to subvert heritage. People coming in thinking they're going to buy a jar of mustard and they go out with a lot of information about industrial heritage in their heads. <laughs> and I think you also, probably as several speakers have said, need to think about different ways of selling it. Certainly several references to social media. Um, I know the first uh, and, and some of the other speakers are going to mention uh, uh, digital means. We've used virtual reality quite a lot. We work with computer departments in universities a lot. And I think, again, that's crucially about the audiences of the future. Get the media right and you will begin to hook the audiences in new ways. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our fourth speaker is Matthew Grenby, who is Professor of 18th Century Studies and Director of Research in the School of English at the University of Newcastle. Um, he's written extensively on the political fiction of the 1790s, child readers and the history of children's literature. And today he's going to talk a bit about one of uh, the Care for the Future Exploratory Awards um, that we recently funded, which involves very much children and also the digital. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I do have a position. I do have a position on uh, what is the future of heritage, and I hope it's a very uncontroversial position. It is to pick up on what Michael was just talking about there, the importance of engaging children and young people, the future of heritage in that sense, that very literal, literal sense. Um, 
This does come out of an AHRC project, which uh, the AHRC generously, and if I may say so, wisely funded, which is about uh, children's literature. I'm a specialist in children's literature. That's kind of relevant in some ways. But it's mostly about the ways in which young people have in the past and will in the future engage with all sorts of different kinds of heritage. Uh, it starts, I mustn't get too focused on this, because this take, could take up the whole of my five to seven minutes, but it starts in the 18th century, because I am very interested in the ways that right from the beginning, 250 years ago, 300 years ago, children were being introduced to heritage in some quite interesting ways through very early kinds of children's literature. I'm not going to get sidetracked into talking about that, although actually there is a kind of relevance which I hope to come back to. But in fact, what I'm looking at more is the, the in this project is the ways that children have during the 19th and especially in the 20th century and now been engaged with different kinds of heritage. Uh, starting from that little boy looking at some drawings in the middle of Stonehenge up to, well, here's Stonehenge again on the right. You can set Stonehenge to vibrate mode on, on that app, apparently. There are some kinds of... Don't uh, fall down. <laughs> very helpful kinds of kind of engagement strategies that you can see there. I'm going to go through some of them. Um, as we've just heard, you know, I can think this is uncontroversial because there are there can be no doubt really that this is the posterity for whom we are preserving heritage. If we want to preserve heritage, it's really children and young people we've got to reach. The demographic, I'm sorry if you're in that picture, but uh, the demographic <laughs> <laughs> is like some part there. And of course the other issue is that so much of the actual criminal damage which is being done to uh, heritage sites is by young people. There's a face board, but we all know about the face sites as well. These are the people who are not just ambivalent about heritage very often, but they are, well, the people who put anti into antiquarian, aren't they? These are people who are just very, very hostile to heritage. And this is a rather extraordinary piece of research which is done by one of my colleagues at Newcastle. He went out into one of the suburbs of northeast Newcastle and he asked people there, which local sites they like, which they dislike. And I like the column, the, the show column there, which says, if a relative was visiting you, what would you show him or her? Segedunum does figure, that's, you know, a fort on the Roman wall in Newcastle, but uh, top is Asda. <laughs> now that is the kind of thing we're dealing with. It's very easy. On Friday, I, I gave a, a lecture, a little talk at St Paul's School for Girls very different kind of environment. There, I talked about uh, this kind of thing, and I was, they, they, they were very engaged with heritage. They were just model consumers of this thing. They were very opposed to any kind of digital solutions as well. It interferes with the site, they were saying. But actually, when we go to a different kind of constituency of young people, the digital has tremendous possibilities, I'm sure we can all agree, as something which can energise <coughs> and really engage, because it's new, because it's exciting. Digital possibilities, just going through a couple of these very fast, things which are already being done. There are lots and lots of really wonderful heritage sector initiatives, things are being undertaken. I put up there some images from the Palace Explorers uh, programme, which Historic Royal Palaces is running. It's a real model of best practice, I think, in some ways. It's about the way in which children can be engaged with something like the Tower of London or Kensington Palace over a long course of time, partly digitally, through blogs and various apps and things online, but also through a kind of traditional version of a, a character who's involved in the story who eventually appears to the children. Well, this is work here, a big, you know, interactive computer game, which they're, they're running very successfully at Colonial Williamsburg in the States. Academics are producing lots of very interesting kind of technically envelope-pushing technologies. That weird person on the left is looking through a time telescope. You adjust the telescope, you don't see, it doesn't bring things into focus kind of visually, but you go backwards and forwards through time as digital images are shown at the end of the telescope. Well, this rather wonderful thing here is a kind of app where you hold it up to a painting and you slide a thing across and it shows you the painting in various states of composition. Well, you can see how you can do that with these buildings as well. You know, the ruin goes back towards the more polished building as it was in the 13th century, 12th century, whatever it may be. Um, private sector initiatives as well. This is just an example from where I live, which is York. You can go around, it, you know, you can, there's a kind of map takes around the city, and these holograms appear in the phone. You can have yourself photographed next to them. It's innovative stuff. I'm, I'm not saying for the moment that it's effective, but it's innovative. And these are commercial companies. It's lucrative for them as well. Children are making their own really astonishing uh, interventions in this as well. This, this picture on the right is from a game called Minecraft. It was only launched a couple of uh, years ago, you make your own world. And children do not just make, you know, 
motor cars and, and, and gym palaces. Or like that. They're, they're making they're making ruins. They're making museums. They're making uh, um, heritage sites in this world. Uh, when we go forward, just thinking very quickly about a couple of possibilities, you know, you can all think of ways in which this could be done extremely well. We could have, you know, geocaching, this is where you kind of have a treasure hunt going through a heritage uh, site, uh, role-playing a certain character from that heritage's past. What I'm particularly keen on is trying to explore this one at the bottom here, this idea of taking archives of different kind of heritage into schools, allowing children to navigate their own sort of way through the archives about their local environment, fitting into some of the things we've been hearing about the community curricula that Michael Gove wants us to embrace, and that these children then can add their own stories, their own material to that archive, so it continues to grow. What a fantastic way of engaging them, a school group, over a long term. Um, but I am no evangelist for digital products. It's very exciting, but there are all sorts of problems with it. And when I'm engaging with you know, English Heritage National Trust, other bodies, I'm continually being told problems from their point of view, and users are telling me problems as well. We are still in a world which, well, any of you who've looked at the 50 things to do before you're 11 three quarters that the National Trust is running, I mean, it's an amazing list. It's, it's rolled down a hill, it's build a bivouac, it's um, a climb a tree. It is not learn to distinguish between a decorated and a perpendicular Gothic archway. You know, we're living in a very Rousseau-esque world. Rousseau is still dominating our idea of what children should be like, what childhood should be like, it should be natural, it should be in the environment. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but it may be very different from what children actually themselves think. Um, this picture in the top right summarises in some ways all that's bad with digital use, doesn't it? Because there they are, they're in a wonderful environment, I hope, and actually all they're doing is looking at their screen. Shouldn't these places be places which are where the screen doesn't function? The one place which the, you know, the internet doesn't reach. Smartphone-free zone also raises questions of um, accessibility. Not everybody has a smartphone. Is this going to just increase a kind of snobbishness at these sites? Although it has to be said that smartphone ownership will be up to about 95% of the population in this country in a couple of years. And there's also anxieties about, you know, heritage agencies running in with new, with, with new technologies which will very soon become old technologies. So there are very real anxieties about this. I'm no evangelist for it. But we certainly do need, I think, to do some more research in this area. We need some evaluative research to work out whether digital interaction actually does pay any dividends or not. Let's analyse it over three or five years. Let's see whether people remember something about their visit that they made ten, uh, a year ago if they had some kind of digital engagement with it, if that's carried on after their visit itself. Let's also um, try and work out what the principles of engagement are. There are plenty of new technologies coming on the street all the time. Some will be good, some will be bad. Different agencies are inventing their own. But actually, surely there have to be some principles which underlie what will be best in terms of digital practice. We can think of all those things as possible, uh, possible kind of practices, possible things which ought to be embedded in any new product which is developed. I'm particularly keen, as a literature person, on the role of story and interactivity. And finally, well, you know, this is why I think this is uncontroversial. We know, as someone was saying earlier, that value is uh, assigned by people. These people are children, because they will grow up to be the people who assign value in the future. And we do need to engage them, otherwise heritage is not going to have a very big constituency. Thank you, Matthew. And our final speaker is um, Dr. Kate Roberts, who works for CADU, the Historic Environment Division of the Welsh Government, and she's worked there for more than 15 years. She's currently the Senior Inspector leading the North and Mid Wales Inspectorate team and also Head of Ar Archaeology um, there. Before she joined CADU, she worked at the Royal Commission on Historic Monuments in England. Hello. I feel like a strange interloper in a peculiar land where things are similar and yet different at the same time. It's very odd. Uh, I'm going to pick up from some of the comments that came from the uh, previous session, which asked uh, quite reasonably, I think, what is going on in the United Kingdom when so many changes are taking place? When we see Scotland and England and Wales all starting to sort of pick up their own uh, identities and move in different directions to some extent with heritage. Um, I also find myself perhaps 
the, uh, the last proponent of a different model, uh, for I am genuinely uh, a man from the ministry, or in my case a woman from the ministry, because of course CADU is a part of the Welsh Government. We are a government division and I am civil servant. So uh, perhaps it's an opportunity to look at the, the different models that are starting to exist across, across the UK. Um, CADU, as it stands, came into existence uh, at the same time as the English Heritage, but as part of the Welsh Office. Uh, and, of course, now as part of the, uh, the Welsh Government. Uh, we sit within the Department of the Sustainable Futures, uh, along with other uh, parts, of the, uh, uh, parts of the Welsh Government, which includes divisions such as regeneration. Uh, we find ourselves moving around the Welsh Government with different ministers. Uh, currently, we are actually within, uh, under the Minister for Culture and Sport, but Previously, we've been in the uh, division of heritage, housing, and regeneration, I should say. It's actually housing, regeneration, and heritage, which is an extremely interesting accumulation, if you like, of, uh, of interests under a single minister. And of course, under our previous administration, when we had a coalition government of Pride and Labour, we actually had our own minister of heritage. And I think this is a very important aspect of what has been happening in Wales over the last few years, a very dynamic circumstance in which heritage has really started to have a very positive um, place within the Welsh Government as illustrated by the Minister of Heritage. Um, present Welsh Assembly's programme for government uh, includes commitment to review heritage protection within Wales and for the first time Wales has really had an opportunity through the Government of Wales Act to review how we do things uh, and to assess for ourselves what would work best for Wales. Um, I should say I suppose that the, uh, the counterbalance to being within government and maybe this is something that we can discuss, the advantages of you like of being outside government and being inside is of course an accountability which works both ways. Uh, Welsh ministers have accountability for <coughs> uh, through the actions of CADIC, and of course are thereby accountable also to their to their voters, to the public of Wales through CADIC. Uh, in 2011, the Welsh government published its uh, historic environment strategy for Wales, which has recently been reissued this year under our current minister, which sets <coughs> out vision for the Welsh uh, historic environment. <coughs> Uh, and sets out really to recognise, protect and to celebrate its place in Wales. Heritage is really finding a new voice <coughs> in Wales. In the last few years we've had for the first time a television series celebrating the story of Wales with that, uh, led by that renowned historian uh, Hugh Edwards uh, who trotted across the countryside but brought a great deal of public interest to sites and as you can imagine we immediately started to see soaring visitor numbers at many of the sites that were shown in that television series. Similarly, extremely popular is the television series The Coal House. I don't know if it was shown in England as well, which was set in the World Heritage Site at Blyne Evan, where a series of cottages were taken back initially to the, sort of the period uh, around the First World War and the second series was to the Second World War, when families went back to live as their ancestors had done. Uh, in these terraced houses, and again, brought a tremendous popular interest in history and the heritage of, in this case, the Welsh families. <coughs> Similarly, we've had initiatives which, I suppose, to some extent, because of the scale of Wales, we've been able to implement uh, a new interpretation project, a heritage pan Wales interpretation plan, which seeks to draw together all the main parties, if you like, involved in the historical environment, not just Caddy the National Trust or the National Museum, but local government, local bodies, local uh, site owners in projects to interpret sites not as individual places in the landscape, but as collections, as landscapes themselves, and, yeah, encouraging people who visit a single site to then go on to follow the story as the line takes them to other sites that also continue that story into the landscape. And also allowing Cadu uh, an opportunity to bring out stories that maybe are not directly related to our own so-called national collection sites, which in itself is not truly really representative of the heritage of Wales. 
So where are we going in terms of protection? Well, in the light of the programme for government's commitment to review protection, we are in the midst of our own consultation. Uh, the consultation for <coughs> the future of our past went live in July of this year and runs a little while longer until October the 11th, which is the closing of the consultation period. That document was in itself the culmination of a year of discussion, workshops, uh, horizon scanning, uh, and you name it, sort of activities and events, including conferences, where we spoke to a large range of bodies, not just practitioners, owners of buildings and other interested parties, to try and really establish what was the general view of how heritage and the historic environment should be protected in Wales. I have to say that a lot of what came out of that didn't really chime and, uh, with the discussions that have taken place here over the last two days. Uh, there was a general feeling that the system as it stands, is, is pretty good. Uh, I'm going to sit and disagree, I suppose, here with various people, but the scheduling, listing, and the other systems that we have in place actually serve a purpose and generally work. Uh, there are obviously areas where things can be enhanced and uh, things that need to be adjusted and improved, particularly to meet challenges which we see coming at us over the next few decades. Uh, but this is all reflected in that document, if you've had uh, an opportunity to read it. It's not about changing legislation, although there will probably be a heritage bill. It's about changing the, uh, the culture, really, of how we work and embedding many of the recent changes which have taken place, such as the adoption of conservation principles. The document is laid out under three snappy headings. Uh, which again link very much with what we've been talking about here. We have identified significance about how we identify what should be cared for and protected. We have sustaining significance, which is all about the management of change, and I do emphasise that, this change of culture to think about change as an inevitability that must be dealt with, not trying to be stopped, like some sort of mad game. <coughs> and the even more snappy titled reviewing the organisational framework for historic environment services in Wales. <laughs> We're obviously going to out of ambition. Uh, but it's clearly also a very important element of it. Um, the objectives of the consultation, the objectives of the new heritage protection approach for Wales are outlined in five phrases with improved protection, increased flexibility, improved accountability, and transparency, streamline and harmonise systems, and strengthen the delivery of historic environment services. And it is on that last point that I suppose still uh, the document raises the very real concerns that I think is mirrored in the conversation today about just how sustainable uh, the current national and local services are. Wales isn't England, although we share many of the same legislative procedures, we do things differently. Um, and in that light, uh, we do still have common concerns. And these, I think the principal one really is the visible reduction in the, uh, in the numbers of, in the amount of professional conservation expertise that we see, particularly at the quality level and how this is deteriorating with increasing budget cuts. Um, as those of you who have seen the document will be aware there is currently also in Wales a review of the delivery of national government services, which applies to Caddy and the Royal Commission. Uh, we are currently reviewing options that might be available for us to be merged or otherwise, depending on the outcome of the study. We're slightly further back in the process than our colleagues in Scotland. Uh, a series of working groups are currently looking at this. Uh, under the headings, which again chime with the thought processes of today, we're looking at questions of the delivery services of knowledge, by which we're covering information, record, survey, investigation, conservation, regulation, protection, advisory services, and public engagement. Because we, like everyone else, recognise that those are the three legs of the heritage stool, like any one without the other system would fail. To finish with that, I'd just like to offer just a few thoughts about 
the change management, because that was something that we talked about quite a lot yesterday. And this um, view uh, that sometimes perhaps heritage professionals have been seen as this, uh, this force trying to prevent change. Uh, to my mind, uh, the acceptance of change is, is no longer really an argument within the profession. Conservation principles make it quite clear that we're not trying to stop change, we're trying to manage an acceptable change. And I think that within the profession is very clear. But nevertheless, uh, I think we have to spare a poor thought, uh, spare a thought that the poor conservation officer, or in my case, ancient monuments inspector, who finds themselves constantly faced with the absolutely unenviable challenge of making that decision. Uh, about what is the effect of this development on the setting of this historic landscape, this historic asset, because of course it always is the setting. It's hardly ever the monument itself, but it's always the setting. <coughs> what is going to be the effect of this moon turbine, this other small change that in itself might seem small, but when it's taken as a cumulative of a consistent change, what is the point when we have to say no? We've thought about the developer and their interests and how they're keen to see things happening. But I have to say, uh, and I throw this in, that speaking from experience, it's a lot easier to say no than to say yes. People, uh, the, the actual level of understanding, skill, or training that you need to have to actually say yes to something, and in particular to negotiate to a point where something can be a yes, is far more challenging than it is just to say, oh no, <laughs> that wouldn't work. And I think we have to say that I see us heading slightly towards a difficult situation where we're both encouraging an attitude of change and control change while reducing the skill, the number of skilled people who maybe have that ability to make that call. And I throw that open as to my mind, one of the biggest challenges that faces us as, uh, as a professional. Thank you. different but also in some senses complementary in other senses maybe in tension with one another uh, on some of those points. Uh, I'm going to open it straight away to the floor for comments, questions, challenges to the panel that they've said. I've been asked to remind you when we hold the microphone, I don't know, you're going to do this, when you hold the microphone, can you make sure you position it like that, kind of in line with the way that you're going to speak into it? So we will be coming down there and a bit more in that direction if you can. Um, but we'll open it to the floor and then maybe try and draw together also some of the points that have come up and have been touched on in what the speakers have said um, that are also there in your postcards and your thoughts, particularly through the course of yesterday. Um, so if we can open it up to the floor now for comments, yeah, one at the back. Chris Society from the Victorian Society. Um, I share Dr. Beattie's regret that there aren't more people from the development community here. Um, I have to say I was slightly disappointed that you can find your remarks to a very narrow area of uh, post war listed buildings. And I was just wondering if you could outline briefly your thoughts, um, either from your perspective or perhaps your client's perspective, on how you think the, the broader heritage system should be developing over the next 10 to 15 years. <coughs> Um, I think that the reason I focus on uh, some of the more recent examples is that it, for me, dramatizes some of the shortcomings of the way generally we probably think about historic assets. Um, and that some of those remarks I made in the middle of my comments about how you want to look in the round at a building's value in terms of its commodity or use could equally apply to Victorian buildings. And I think the other reason I decide to focus on those four things is that they're still items that cause some, if not controversy, then at least uh, questions in the minds of the public. And I think, um, and, and you know, that I'm an avid Victorianist, I think probably most of the, the value of the Victorian things, okay, that wasn't a good one yet, but you know, we understand the limits of it and so forth. Is, uh, I think these questions are most <coughs> dramatic, or are most, in, most clearly articulated, I think, in, in this world where the boundaries are being tested. And, and that's kind of why I focus on Roger Bartlett from English Heritage. Thanks, Chris, for a masterclass in how to do this post-war listing. Brilliant, brilliant. 
it's so useful for me because you know we get asked those things all the time and have an eloquent um, what else can I call you? Eloquent, um, persuasive, highly paid, very successful, recognised consultant. But if so, well, it's really useful for us. Because all of us have got to champion the cause. And is the battle won yet? Um, for so much like heritage, it actually our knowledge is, and that's a source of great satisfaction. But there's always going to be a controversial bit. And generally, it's the modern stuff. We've got in this country 694 listed personal buildings which is a tally far higher than anyone else I know in the world. And there are three, there's designated personal landscapes too. So that's quite a tally, and that's something I'm proud of. We had a symposium at the Getty a couple of years ago, and there was a huge international respect for that. Um, Kate's point about it's a question of managing change is spot on. You're engaged at the um, Commonwealth Institute. Well, well rewarding work, that's excellent. Um, that's going to be an enormous change. You know, it's listed. Deal with it. Does it matter? Of course it does. So I think, you know, I come out of this gathering, from which I've gained an awful lot and very, very good. Um, you know, there have been pretty clear issues, but above all, knowing where you stand, what are the constraints on private owners, articulating all these things are so profoundly important to our, to our future. Um, it's been very energizing for me. Thanks. I'm going to reply, feel free. I won't comment on the table, because that seems a, a little personal, actually. But I mean, I won't comment on the, um, the common history of what it illustrates about the, um, about the process. And what you're absolutely right. It was enormous change over the world. With the, through the offices of David McDonald, who was so supportive. I mean, that was a building that was on sort of last legs. That was the last, the last chance salute for the left. Um, and what it illustrates for me, though, is that the level of intervention we got there through consent was only possible because of really strong political wealth at the, at the local level in Kensington and Chelsea. Because that building was really dragging down that part of Kensington High Street. There was enormous support politically for that. And I think without the building's potential to regenerate what was perceived to be a uh, underperforming part of the borough. Um, we probably wouldn't. Now, that doesn't mean to say we haven't been able effectively to remake that building in fact similarly, which is what we're doing. Um, it's merely to say that there were other considerations that were at play there which were very powerful. It's Peter Hinton from Institute for Archaeologists again. Okay. Sorry. Um, Kate, it was very interesting to hear from you about the Welsh Government programme. Um, and uh, I think we're all enjoying preparing our responses to the green stroke white paper, uh, which will ultimately result in a, in a heritage bill amongst other things. And interesting too to read in that the review of the um, options for delivering historic environment advice to local authorities uh, can be done through the local, directly through the local authorities um, for conservation advice and through the four Welsh trusts funded by CADO largely. Um, for our political services. Quite brave and radical stuff being looked at. What the outcome is, we will see in due course. Um, in Scotland, we have just finished responding to the joint consultation, both on the merger, but on the draft Scottish Historic Environment Strategy, a Scottish Government consultation on a strategy that is Scotland's and not Scottish Government's. Uh, and common to both of those exercises, we have had ministers who passionately believe in the value of contribution of heritage and also believe that, and quite willing to state publicly, that heritage must do more than simply drive the economic agenda. Uh, even in Northern Ireland, the minister there has a vision for the future of heritage which involves massive job creation uh, and, and development of the tourism industry. So for this largely English audience, I wonder if the question is why in England we are currently dealing with things like consultations on extensions to committee development rights, the red tape challenge, and the government vision for the historic environment that has been withdrawn from the department's website and hidden away. Uh, is it not now time for an English vision for the historic environment? <laughs> Okay. 
putting together because there's not very many of us. The academy is very small, so collaboration has always been the, the, the name of the game. Uh, now more so than ever, as budgets are reducing, we recognise that the only way forward is to collaborate. Uh, options like, uh, if anyone has seen it on our website, uh, say the Panwell's interpretation project, uh, probably not achievable in, in somewhere like England because of the, the, the sheer number of people involved. But it has enabled us to take themes of real resonance in Wales in, in Welsh Nation, but particularly to do with the industrial period uh, in the 19th century, but also bringing out the story of uh, that people are maybe less familiar with. Uh, I mean, a good example we were talking earlier is, is Wales's first ever World Heritage Site, the Castles of Edinburgh, has widely been recognised as, as an English site in the middle of Wales. Um, not something that necessarily presents the story of Wales. In the last few years, with Welsh Government funding, we've carried out a project which has really uh, conserved and brought to light the sites which are the other side of that story, the sites of the Welsh princes of Gwyneth, which is the reason why Edward was there in the first place, building these things. Uh, I wonder to myself, if a World Heritage Site was being created now, would it be the same World Heritage Site? Because frankly, one side of the story is, is not telling you what was going on in that period. The Castle of Conway looks out across at the Castle of De Ganwy, uh, which is far more spectacularly sighted, and has now been conserved and is accessible, and people can go there and see both sides of the story. And the opportunity to try and broaden that narrative, to broaden the story, and allow people see that there's two sides to it. It's such an exciting opportunity uh, that would only be possible with collaboration because we don't own the young. It's in private hands. So you know, it means that you have to sort of take that story out of our insights, out of the collection and into the, the landscape. Question. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we will come back. <laughs> Thank you very much. I say that I'm Donald, I'm an Education Secretary at the IHBC, um, and as Chris has mentioned, I was formerly leading the Conservation and Design Team at Kensington and Chelsea. I'm not going to dwell on that to begin with, but first of all, just to thank all the speakers this afternoon for their uh, range of views. And I was quite surprised actually early on that I found myself actually agreeing with what Chris was saying, not so much about his criteria for, for a listing, about, about some of his other remarks. And I think it was very good that he did mention the elephant not in the room, which is the development developers, building owners, investment managers, those people who have a real key effect on our environment. And I think that probably has been, if I can make the remark, something that's been lacking in the, in the conference up to now. Um, the other speakers I did appreciate because a lot was about their appreciation and getting other people to appreciate heritage, particularly young people. And I think that's really great and I fully support it. And I think I think it's one of the things on the postcard that I filled in earlier. But these things are going to take a long time to filter their way through. I think that's the, that's the problem that we're facing with at the moment. And I think it was Kate's remarks, and of course she would say I would agree with this, about the loss of conservation officers and the difficulty that that is holding. There was really something that that's happening. that was really having a resonance for me. One point she did mention was the easy to say no. And that will bring me back to the Commonwealth Institute because in some ways it would have been dead easy to say no. And at Kensington, and as well as English Heritage, we agonised long and hard about it. There was no easy decision making to be made there. And well, we'll see what happens. You know, work is on site at the moment. But what that's leading me to is my current role as Education Secretary is that actually there is something going on here, as well as a loss of conservation officers, which is causing a real problem. There is the skill level of those conservation officers in the post who tend to be not, shall we say, I like to think old and wise like myself, but very old, but they're younger and maybe less experienced. Mm -hmm. And actually there's a role in education generally for those professionals and others throughout the building mm -hmm. environment professions to actually get them better at what they do. And also also to not just to encourage them to get their C P D up, but actually to mentor and give people more confidence in what they're doing. Future. And I think that's one thing that we should be addressing. Thank you. Just go back to number two on the slide. Go back there. Yes. <laughs> um, Kate Pugh from the Heritage Alliance. We've talked a lot here about uh, getting more public opinion behind us, about making allies with the development industry and so on. I 
uh, support that enormously. Uh, we're very strong in that we should get others to speak up for us as well as uh, the ambassadors ourselves. But I feel that this is very long term, and yet we're hearing my comparison that there are you know, really seismic moves afoot in Wales and Scotland, and rather ignoring what's coming up on our doorstep, which is the consultation on the English Heritage's new model, which will happen in this autumn. And I do feel that this is a really good opportunity to actually do what we, what we want to do in the long term, but to do it in the short term as well. And I wonder if the panel has any ideas how we can use this consultation code to advantage. Absolutely, why not? 
but it requires, and I think Alex mentioned it, that actually engaging volunteers to do something really useful takes a lot of time, but I think it's worth the investment. However it's funded, it's definitely worth the investment if you can achieve what you set out to achieve. So I totally agree you should try and do it. I'm not sure that my comments have just come to me. I think I think I've endorsed it and maybe take it a bit further. Um, uh, we talked earlier about um, the effective stewardship of, of heritage assets and the kind of squeeze on particularly local authorities. Um, not enabling them to do maybe what they should do with their uh, stewardship resources. And I think there's a, a real opportunity to harness um, the third sector and volunteers to, to do that. But I think in some respects there's an impediment. There's, there's certainly, in some local authorities, a view that although they're being squeezed, they should hang on to those things. Um, and I know there's some token legislation in place for assets for community value to be offered tentatively to communities, but then possibly <coughs> drawn that maybe those kind of things need more teeth to actually help uh, communities in the third sector take charge of assets that the public sector can't look after as well as we need to. Can I just add one thing, which is, and it was, it was a word up that, that came into mind last night, it was about education, but it's come up again today. And I'm starting to think of what Matthew was talking about, which is, and it's education at all levels. Because actually, if somebody doesn't know what's on the edge of the village, how are they going to know that they ought to get engaged with it and involved with it? And then actually, that's the whole business of if we don't know it's there, we will lose it. Which is why the kind of projects Alex was talking about and the people that ride across the whole country, we need more of that because it's about access to information. And I think that at the moment, the public don't get access to information. Why is it that I can sit anywhere in the world? And go on to Canmore and find out the, the monuments of Scotland, but I can't through the English Heritage website. Never have been able to. Um, was, was it Sir Ronald Reagan who said uh, to the Gordon Shop, tear down this wall? And I don't know whether he was consulting any heritage professionals when he asked him to do that. <laughs> but that's the sort of thing I might say to the president of the Antiquarian Society today. You know, well, maybe not these walls because they are so lovely, but the point is to try and make more porous the walls between the heritage sector and all of these other sectors that we're talking about. Just because the demographic that goes to heritage sites is older, that doesn't necessarily mean a problem. Even when we're talking about engaging young people, that kind of intergenerational uh, engagement is very important. Similarly, well, we've been talking about the University of the Third Age and various other groups like that, but I would say one of the most important ways in which the heritage sector can grow and uh, achieve its ends is to cooperate more with universities, the constituency that I um, represent. Uh, that kind of goes back to the point you were making, David McDonald, I think, about education and about the way that there are going to be cuts in education in the heritage agencies themselves. Well, there are people in universities who are crying out, not to, you know, I don't want to offend the union and say that we're going to come and take your job, but to collaborate uh, with the kind of work that you're doing. So it's about making the boundaries a little bit more porous, and to my mind, they are at the moment. Okay, very briefly, there are quite a few hands. I was just going to say, actually, it's unfortunate that I noticed that uh, Ollie uh, from Cardiff University just sort of legged it just before it started because he's actually been doing a fantastic project <coughs> in the community in Cardiff, which has been exactly that, which is adopting their local hill fort and investigating it. It's just a shame he's not here now to, to tell us about it. Great. Thank you. Uh, Graham, uh, I'm just down to be online. Um, one of the things I teach now at the university in that's what I always just get on me, you know, so. <laughs> um, I'm not talking about the same reason the whole group involved than just a panel, and I want to pick up on the last two points as it happens, coincidentally. But I want to possibly be a little bit critical. Uh, I start by saying it's not a critical presentation, but that's an extremely good presentation in the last two days. And some of this morning we're moving in exactly that direction in terms of sharing information and community involvement with the person this afternoon. But we've also heard many people say that in this room that sent a very narrow spectrum. Certainly the society, and possibly even the energy sector, and certainly the sector that deals with them, property building sites and so on. And yet time and what have we whilst I had that pointed out to us, and we all know it anyway, to me pointing out. We still nonetheless continually pull ourselves on being brought back to fairly small focus points, like excuse me, 
like other podcasts, for example, we've got other examples. And I think the, the issue is obviously much, much bigger, and we, we have a case touch on the broader issue in the last two days anyway. Um, but I want to try to, I mean, talk about how these engage people, everybody, society, and how you do it. I think, I think like Rosalind's code in common, how do we do it? I want to tie that in to some extent with what we just said about nature conservation and our perception that they've got an easier life than they have good story, they've got extinction, biodiversity, could be happiness. And we don't have anything to compete with that. I think we do. I think closer to the average citizen than, than even the most curly animal is the street they live in. And it could be a street devoid of any of this building, devoid of anything possibly remotely in this tool, devoid of anything known possibly, but it's still going to be at least a week old and probably 10 years, probably in this country, 100 years old, underneath that skeleton of several thousand years, all there. So when we say that how we engage with people, we tend to use words like educate, teach, pass on information. We occasionally talk about sharing information, but it turns out we're more going about capturing systems, but their information drive into our structures. Why don't we go to people, instead of deciding how to talk to them, just go and listen. We, 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 we talk to people and we don't listen. We should listen and not talk. We should send projects which take us to communities, preferably communities devoid of any, any um, recognised heritage, and simply ask people what they see when they walk down their street. What they see is important, what's valuable, how old they think it is. We can then have a discussion about how we, how we think it is and so on, or what's beneath it. But start with their heritage rather than trying to impose our heritage. Because nearly all the hedges we've heard about these last two days has been hedges that is defined by, is, has been common. One thing is always somewhere else. It's always a big visitor in the town centre, or it's a major site of the, of the country, <coughs> or in the continent, or it's something else in the land, or it's always somewhere else, never where the person is. So I think we should, and this is why I think we all look more closely at the, the meanings between the lines of the Bible Convention. We should look at hedges from the other end of the telescope, not from our top-down, expert-led, academic, whatever you want to use, view of what's important. Forget the idea of the best. We should turn the whole telescope down and look at what is somewhere locally, the context, place, what people have around them, what they live in, what they walk past. And from that, we'll look at support. And if we do that for people with local heritage, one day they might be support what we want them to support as well. It doesn't work for them. Like how many years are trying to do it, it doesn't work. Can I just make a quick plug for the People's Collection website? I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's a, uh, it's a website that's established by uh, Welsh Government. It was Cunnell and uh, Royal Commission, actually, which is exactly such a resource. Really. It is a website that provides communities with an opportunity to post on their stories that they think are important to them uh, and to draw together the information we have, the photography, the maps, the scores and things. And if you haven't been on it, it's well worth a look because it does provide just such a, uh, an opportunity for communities to celebrate their own uh, passions. But it just created an, an engagement, it didn't create a dialogue. It does because there's actually a process for helping them which is facilitators from, in this case particularly, World Commission, will visit a community and help them to start that process off. Uh, at the same time, taking with them the, uh, the National Monument Record, <laughs> <laughs> so that as information comes out of that, it can be incorporated into, if you like, the formal record as well. So there's actually a model that does allow for that engagement. I think very much scepticism continues on that. <laughs> very, very <laughs> much. Just, just have one quote again, I can't remember how many of that project happened to the basement, but I remember one on Kilburn High Road where basically the applicant said exactly what Graham said, which is, we want to understand our local street. It was funded, and actually when you looked at it, you thought, you could do this for the whole of the country, and it would be fantastic, and maybe one day we will. Well, to an extent, you yeah. Your last bit of time, you did to an extent. Could I just offer an observation? I agree entirely with what Graham has said. Um, I, I, I do some work through this, at the Center of Urban History at Leicester University, and there's a very good oral history project there, and they just received very large grants to receive one to the project. It was all about capturing the stories of people who used to work in industry at the time and making that available. And I think we might even be guilty here, those of us who have a historical background, of not thinking about the wider historical spectrum. There is a discipline, it's called oral history, it's not mobilizing people. It isn't used to capture reflections. Um, and there's no reason why recording of that could be achieved in many ways, including, for example, through the development process. So 
that's another reason why I'm not part of the master in that movement. So I don't think you should overlook the things that are in play, you just need to engage with them. The troubles are private. Okay, next, next question. Um, I, which, well, actually, I was going to talk about value more generally, but just picking up on what Graham said, um, in, this, in this world, we've just run the, the environment sector, has just run what people care about. Um, so, and what it's shown in politicians is actually the public at large don't care much about the environment as far as they're concerned. We've done the recycling, we're not interested in climate change, we're over all that. But what they do care about is their local neighbourhood. So what you'll see politically in Australia is a whole new interest from politicians in that kind of local neighbourhood story. So that's another platform for thinking about the kind of things we're talking about. But what I wanted to do is to just maybe be a plea um, in the group to go back to that agenda also of thinking about the value of what we do and how we do it. And it's easy to be cynical about the value agenda, to say, well, you know, we did some economic impact assessment and we went to the Treasury and they still didn't fund us. Um, and we've all been there and we've all been through that. And, and all that happens is as soon as you win the value argument, the Treasury changes the rules. But that doesn't actually stop the whole discussion about the different ways in which looking after heritage and doing it creates value. Because it's in that discussion of value that you can make those connections to those other agendas, to the economic agenda, to the university agenda, to the education agenda, to the social agenda. And for me, the remark yesterday at the conference that stuck with me most was this idea of Bruce Pete Stone of becoming a force multiplier. I thought, you know, when you said you'd struggle for six years to get the military to understand what you're talking about until they really suddenly realised that actually doing heritage was going to make their job a whole lot easier. And I think the question for us is how do we become a force multiplier? How do we make that connection to the other things that people want to do, whether it's around localism, whether it's around gender, through heritage? And to do that, we've got to start thinking about why we matter and how we create value. Um, and I think it has some interesting points around that. I think Chris is sort of restating the listing criteria in a way that actually showed how um, you know, picked up things that created long-term value it was, I thought, genius. But it was really exciting. It was sort of really interesting. It was really challenging. And so I think that's just the thing that I'd leave, leave with the group is um, if we're going to be thinking about the big picture, if we're thinking about the future of the charity, if we're thinking about the future of the sector, if we're thinking radically, one way into that is to think radically about how many different ways we can, might, and do create value in a really kind of Catholic and eclectic way. I think one, Malcolm Ayres, Oxford University, I think one of the things that these two days have shown is this sector of not knighting is very articulate. Um, questions tend to turn into speeches. Um, two points. One is how do you engage with your local uh, region politically? I made the point yesterday, I'll do it again today. The neighbourhood development plan process is one way. It's easier in rural areas than in urban areas, but it is one way of engaging a community to see the value of their historic environment. Um, the other is additionality. Um, those of you who are old enough to have heard John Major launch the HLF when he gave the commitment that it would not mean additionality. Um, it's happening in a different way. And the taking of funding away from local authorities. Chris Mealy has just said what we need is more local <coughs> democracy and decision taking. You need the expertise there, and that expertise needs to be funded. You mentioned the neighborhood plan, which was a very hot topic about a year ago or thereabouts. It certainly hasn't worked in urban situations. In fact, the day of many, I think there's only one I'm aware of coming forward, and it is in the rural era, started about a year and a half ago. I'm not aware of any others coming forward. In the rural level, sorry? Oh, so it's up to the southern. And the question then is, and there's a, a number of pilots for it there, and the question then is the sort of topics that emerge in community plans, certainly in rural locations where I've seen in the draft, are 
Regrettably for us, perhaps in this room, are not the sort of issues necessarily we're talking about. They're more about limiting the development rights around boundaries and controlling lay land in life um, and rubbish. And uh, you have to be careful. I mean, I, I am in favor of local decision making. I am, uh, and as a fundamental democratic principle. But you know, if we ask, uh, we have to ask it the right way because sometimes the issues that come up are um, really quite mundane, albeit very important locally. And then, and then as you know, Malcolm, there's a long history of planning system trying to mobilize community, successive governments, and it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Come and see the emerging Dorchester on the <laughs> Can I just respond on the additionality bit? Um, one of the things that we say in here, three things. Uh, one was about flexibility. The other was about judgment. Judgment of our officers to be able to actually have the confidence not to go to the rule book but say, may not be normally what we do, but that's a good idea. Let's do it. Um, and the other one was, was actually to make things simpler. And I, I use the word simple rather than easy. If it was easy, we'd just have a bank all by the way and put on the credit card and you'd get lottery money out. But a simpler application process. We're already evaluating this. Um, I think Judy's gone, she was here this morning. We're already beginning to say, well, given what's happened, even since this was launched, which was July last year, um, what can we do differently? And the point you just made about expertise at local authority levels, it's, it's the point about revenue funding. There's, there's, there's actually a lot that could be done as long as it comes through as, as projects. Because by law, through the, the national whatever it's called, Heritage Lottery Act or whatever, it says we can only give grants to projects. Now, that, that, and some of our projects can last five years. Now, surely, it's not beyond the wit of local authority people to come up with projects that could be a benefit to all people doing one of the things we've said doing, but it wouldn't even have got to change. They can't just do what they're currently doing. So, there is a massive opportunity. Having said all that, competition for our funding has never been greater. And, and actually, um, dare I be fair to this government, they increased the percentage share from 16.6 to 20%. So now, our annual budget, when I joined HLF, it was doom and gloom. It was 2007. Oh, we've only got 180 million. Well, I had just come from English Heritage. 180 million. It's fantastic. It's an archaeologist. Now it's 400 million. But still, the average, we're rejecting 60%. Now, most funders would say, that's a fantastic rejection rate. They're rejecting 90%. So actually, we're in a reasonably good place. But if we, in a sense, we've got to change, which is why it's also we've got to be radical about how we view the future. Thank you. I'm very conscious of the time, but we've got three people queued up for questions over here, and someone over here as well. So let's go for those three, and then one more. So. I want to think about you. Sorry, Richard. I want to think about you, UK a bit more, following up some comments. From Kate and that also out this morning, and also some comments that one made about, as I understood it, thinking about what sort of heritage we actually want, and following up what he's just been speaking about, about projects. Now, projects tend to be very localised and deal with sense of place. And I suppose my reflection on you know, what's going on in Wales is, and Alex is in a far stronger position, and it's an interesting observer who's worked in Scotland for quite a long period of life. That uh, Scotland seems to be going through a similar process of looking at its heritage quite carefully and you know, focusing attention on it in a creative way. Now, uh, Peter Hinton mentioned uh, doing something similar here, and my initial reaction to that um, is sort of almost horror because I, I do worry about nationalism. Now, I then thought a bit more about it and thought actually, in some ways, that might not be a bad thing to work on because. You know, some of the sort of problematic issues I tried to raise yesterday start proving um, the things we have to deal with. And I, I do think perhaps in Wales and Scotland, you know, people in Wales and heritage politicians are not trying to do that. So perhaps thinking about the sort of broader agenda, if we're going to be daring and try and really, really create a sort of concept sort of relevance of what we do, we should think about what Peter Hinton suggested some more, perhaps. Or am I being foolish? I don't know. Can I just comment? It may not be foolish at all, Richard. And if you think of identity and the challenges facing uh, colleagues in Northern Ireland over identity, they've got their community relations council and they've got it. They, because, especially now, in the decade, what they call the decade of anniversaries, 
because then the decade of anniversaries uh, from, from uh, really 1914 to 1924, because Northern Ireland was created in 1924, Imagine that in terms of funding that might come to us, for example, or anywhere else. Which bit do you fund and how? And then you raise the question of identity in England. And as you say, don't go there. You know, when did England and Scotland last play a football game in, in public? And you know, it's really long ago. How long was it before that? I thought it was behind closed doors. Anyway. Um, and there was a previous government that said that what we would what we would like you to fund is a museum of British identity. And everybody shrank, shrank, and gave him violence. But there was a working group, and it managed to keep him to the wild grass. It's a really difficult area, but maybe now is the time. But, and how do you define being English? We define being English by, we're not Welsh, we're not Scottish, we're not Irish. Or French, yes. It's German, it's German, it's German. I'm doing mindful of how to speak to you. I'm going to say two very, very brief things. Now, the first one, I sense a bit of an agreement around Graham's point, but I, I think it's very important to note what Chris said, that there's been broad agreement on that point for many years, and there's an enormous number of very, very good exemplary projects out there which have done this and have done it for the last 20 years. So I think, I think it's important to build on that, actually look at the good experience, build and build on it. But the other one I have is just a straightforward question to Bob. Bob, you were asked, um, how, in your view, we should use the, <coughs> the upcoming consultation on, on the Polynesian heritage responsibilities um, to promote um, the sector's uh, welfare? Really. And you, you said, be radical. Could I just ask you to expand on that in a personal capacity if you feel, <laughs> if you feel doing the professional capacity for not going to be inappropriate? Because be radical is nice, but there are many sorts of radical. I, I'd be very interested to know what your views are. Thank you, Chris. I was thinking, I just said the radical. Somebody's going to ask me, what do you mean by the radical? So I've had a few minutes to think about it. Um, and I think it's not a question, but I can't answer it. Which is actually to say that I don't think we should, we should necessarily start from where we are, which is difficult, because of course we have to start from where we are. But if you then say, well, what's best for the heritage and not what's best for the staff of English heritage or whatever, or for your jobs or whatever else, actually take a step back and say, what is the best for the heritage in 50 years' time? If you take the picture of whoever it was who put a picture of somebody who was very young up there, it's their future heritage. One of the things we're thinking about in HLF is that next year, we're having a big heritage debate, as it's called. Um, and it's kind of our chair's swan song, because it'll be her last uh, meeting. It'll be sometime in July. And one of the questions that we were going around the country looking at our committees, um, and sorry, when I say the country, I mean the United Kingdom, and in Wales, somebody said, but I'm interested in what the heritage will look like in 40 years' time. And I've held on to that as actually being something for that conference. That what, what would be, how could we leave it in a better place than it is now? And actually, that's the, that's the radical bit. It may be that that bit of English heritage is completely different from anybody that anybody could think of. And that's why I say radical, because I've been through at least, as Adrian knows, I've been through well, two reviews, mergers. I've left English Heritage more times than I've merged back in, but it was getting close when Jeremy Hunt says you're going to merge H11 and English Heritage. And I said, I'll have to die, because I couldn't be merged back in. It would be too embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Is that getting off the hook? Chris? So I was wanting to just pick on the point Graham made, but the conversation, the question laughs a bit, but go back to that. There are lots and lots and lots of these community projects which originate in what people want in their communities, and the 500 of the HLF, all our stories projects, running this year alone, and oh, I don't want to keep promoting the HLF, but uh, they have no, set up a new ongoing project to do exactly and that is simply going to communities and say, or ask, inviting them to say, what are you interested in, come and do it. And what we've found is that people then get drawn into other projects and other communities, other groups get drawn into that. So that is not that to be invented, that already exists. And there's a long tradition of community archaeology from that as well. Um, I was also, I, I hesitate to mention this, but the idea of a museum of England or Britain Interest. I always find when I go to somewhere, uh, wherever, 
We want to go to the National Museum and find out about stuff that came from that country. Uh, the Museum of London is a fantastic example of somewhere where you can find out about stuff that came from London. It's always a, a shame perhaps there isn't a museum just about stuff that's come from the British Isles, the United Kingdom, England, or whatever. Personally, that's a personal opinion. In these last two days, I have the impression that people don't know they exist in this room in the heritage sector. And if they do know they exist, they don't think it means heritage. They think it means something else. What I'm trying to say is that the product of those things is as much heritage as, as all the way on this is put together. And I don't think people in this room think that. that that's the message I'm trying to get across. We need to change. People have to change. We need to change. Okay. Question you. We've been patiently waiting for about 10 minutes. So it's not quite so much a question, but just respond to it. It kind of connects with a few things that have been said. There are actually, like, when some very early this morning, the PCLG announced there are 346 neighborhood areas now in place. We're quite right, there's only three plans, but that is going to be a time back to think about um, the shortest one took 10 months to draft and adopt and go through this public inquiry. Um, but I think the connection is that um, once that's in place, and in fact only last week the government announced that those who are, are uh, properly formulated and approved neighbourhood area forum uh, will now have a shortcut route into being parish councils. So we have the first parish council in 60 years in, in London, uh, in Westminster, and I think there's going to be more. And the reason there's going to be more is they are then going to have the advantage of having section 106 in the same one, us from York developers <coughs> directly to them to spend. And I think that a lot of some of the projects that we're talking about, and also the belief in that area, or however they define heritage, could well be an area where they want to spend their money. So maybe in a time of short of resources, that may be a, a connection between some of the things we've been saying. And that's my question here. Yeah. We've been skirting around the West Lothian question in the past, and one of the reasons surely why the heritage has a low political profile is simply that our government is responsible for the big UK issues and management, and yet at another level it's dealing with local issues within England, and those local issues inevitably play a second fiddle to the, the big issues. I think that's part of the difference between Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and the England and the Wales Treaty. We also shy away from a national identity um, in a way that Scotland, Wales, I'll keep Ireland out of it. So we are. Do not. I think those identities have by and large be positive. And one of the problems in England is that I think we end up with the absence of a positive image of who we are. Develop gives the space for negative images of who we are, which are a real problem. So you know, I, I think there are structural problems, perhaps, that have all may agree or disagree <coughs> in, the, in the way heritage sits in the general <coughs> governments of the UK. Historically, of course, heritage has emerged in the context of national identity and sort of duplication. So, the <coughs> nationalist narrative, which is the signature feature in this country, is um, is probably quite wonderful. It's probably the most described. Do you agree um, John Patel from English Heritage. I just want to come back to a point made by Matthew about um, the potential for collaboration between um, colleagues and universities working on heritage-related uh, subjects uh, and those, uh, those of us working in sort of the cliff face and in the heritage sector. And of course, I think we all agree that that's a really important thing. I think one of the things that stands out to me about this conference is the fact that we've been able to have that engagement over the last few days. Um, and um, clearly there's potential for um, finding out a lot more about um, uh, increasing knowledge of different types of, sort of heritage assets, as well as um, exploring, developing the kinds of methods um, for engaging um, the public through know, digital media and the sorts of things that we've been talking about. 
Um, but also, I think, for reaching some sort of consensus about the kind of training that we offer through the universities, um, so that we can be as sure as we can be that the training on offer really does meet the requirements of the sector as a whole. Um, and I think there's great potential for further discussion on all of those themes. Um, and um, I think my question is really how do we continue that collaboration? And in particular, how do we find out more about what our respective kind of research priorities are, both within the universities and in, in the heritage sector as a whole? How do we achieve some sort of alignment between those so that we maximise the resources that we have uh, internally? That is maybe a job for the AHRC. I hesitate to say, but uh, I, yeah, I mean, I agree. The only thing I'm worried about is that uh, I can't speak for the, the heritage studies departments because I don't come from one, but the only thing that I'm worried about is that, that is a very close and obvious vocational link. There are plenty of other departments within most universities which would be dying to help. I'm not just talking about history, but literature, art history, sociology, geography, all sorts of areas which would be very, very interesting. It is a question of getting these groups together, as you say, and uh, the Arts and Humanities Research Council could be a very important boom in that. My I think it probably goes beyond just it's a nice thing to do. Um, certainly from the university perspective, uh, the wrath of the retail excellence framework almost compels <laughs> <laughs> universities to work with the real world organisations like us. And we do quite a lot and from our perspective in terms of the resource side. Uh, we now have lots of very bright, willing students from all kinds of faculties working with us. So, um, I don't know whether we're unusual, but I think in the future there's going to be a lot more third sector heritage and uh, university academia general collaboration. Uh, John is uh, side round, please. Uh, just three things. Um, I'm probably going mad, but I thought, Graham, you sat down there yesterday and said, all history is all history, heritage is heritage. Kick all history in touch. Yes, so, I'm talking history generally. Oh, right, okay. So, well, some, just a little. <laughs> Thanks as to how you come around to what you just said. We'll talk about that later on. Uh, um, um, but the, uh, the other thing is, uh, I just want to bring this back to engagement with developers. And um, no, there aren't, probably aren't any developers here, but there's a, an enormous part of the heritage sector and heritage professionals, there are some people in here uh, from that sector, who actually probably spend most of their careers working with developers. And part of our job has been to explain heritage to them. And by and large, you get a few, but by and large, they're very intelligent people. They're not stupid. Wouldn't you agree, John? Yeah. And, you know, and actually, so the heritage sector is engaging with the development sector and the people who are building these things. We're doing it. Um, and just as an aside, actually, one of the things that sometimes uh, doesn't do the heritage sector a great exact, uh, a lot of favours is, is when uh, the developer, developers actually come to meet the regulatory side. Um, and sometimes there's quite a, quite a sort of walls are set up and positions are taken, um, uh, and that's not particularly helpful, uh, speaking from experience. And thirdly, I think education is vitally important uh, and engaging. Um, uh, people of all ages, but particularly the young, and actually we're having a bit of a debate in the society at the moment as how the society of entities, believe it or not, um, can actually start to think about engaging younger people. Some of the views from fellows are quite extreme, and they're <laughs> very significant. I'm obviously not doing this, you know, you should hear some of the views, but there are, fortunately, uh, a lot of fellows who do recognise that we are a charity for public benefit, and one of the things that we have to do is actually engaged the fellows of the future. Um, well, unless we do that, this society, our heritage, and everything goes down and goes on the same. Yeah, I'm going to be the most. I guess, I guess <laughs> just one, one of the things that we haven't really touched on in the course of the discussion, I'm aware the time has picked away from us, is, is, is how this debate, how the discussions here are fed into the materials that you brought through your postcards through the course of the event. I mean, a lot of that was focused around this question of communication with various publics we're talking to. And I think it has been touched on by the speakers here and also in the discussion. You've 
hand. Um, I think the keynotes that would also be worth pursuing from that and the ongoing discussions that will need to take place, perhaps in the run up to next year's conference on heritage debates, there um, are around this question, which comes up time and time again in the postcards, uh, around how heritage contributes, should it contribute, does it need to contribute to the concept of economic growth and how we feed value into a much broader question. That would be a discussion that would go on for well past the time we still have available to us. But one question I was going to end on with the panel, but time has kind of slipped away, but I think would be well worth us all considering as we, um, as we go from today's event, is, is what in, say, 50, what in 100 years' time would we want this heritage context to look like? It's been touched on a little bit by um, some of the speakers here, but it's very much given that this, the focus of this event is around the concept of centenary, which is both the celebration and the commemoration, but also a reflection on what has worked, what has been achieved, perhaps those areas that would need to be uh, focused on in a different way in the future. What would be those things in 50 or 100 years' time that a panel like this, or maybe not a panel like this, would need to be addressing about the future of heritage uh, protection, but also heritage in a much broader conceptualization. What do we want heritage to achieve? How do we want to use heritage? And what does heritage actually mean? Those are much bigger questions which we don't have the time to get into at this particular point. But I'd like to thank the panel and thank you as an audience as well for your contributions to this session.